Okay. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you all for joining us on this very special Lotus Live. We have um, BACA here, an organization that you're going to hear so much about. It's so amazing. Um, as always, I have Sarah Elizabeth here, my co-creator with Red okay. Lotus Live. And then this is Chris. Can I just call you Shot? Yes. Okay. All right. So this is Chris with his chapter of BACA, which is Bikers Against Child Abuse. I'm just really excited to have you here because I've known shots for, I, I feel like a long time. We've just kind of crossed paths. <laughs> many years, really, yeah. yeah. And so um, whenever we had that experience with the giving tree this year, I really wanted to um, really reach out to my community and find out exactly the organizations here that are resources for domestic violence survivors um, those who are experiencing child abuse have child abuse cases, um, all of those things. So really happy that Baca is here today and we're going to hear all about what they do. And also one thing that I didn't realize is that they are global and that is, this is huge. So, um, Chris, I'd just like you to go ahead and introduce yourself. And if everyone else could introduce themselves too, that'd be great. Yeah, that's great. So my name is Schatz. I've been with Baca for a little over 17 years. Um, I got into it because uh, I had some guy come. I was in the printing industry and I had some guy, a Baca member, stop by my office and give me, uh, uh, give me, wanted me to print the book for him. Uh, and uh, anyway, so while he was in my office, we were discussing the, the, the book that they were wanting to print about Baca. Um, he saw behind my desk a picture of me on my motorcycle and he said you ride and i'm like yeah absolutely i do and and he said you should, you should come check us out we've got a meeting this thursday and so i thought you know i, I was just 24 25 years old at the time and and a, not a lot of people my age had harleys and so i didn't have uh many people to ride with so i'm like oh cool i'll, I'll meet these people and you know be able to have some cool people to ride with that has good morals but i had no clue what baka really was at that point it was it was amazing it, it was something that got me into it and once you actually help your first child out and realize that you are a part of the reason that they actually are doing better you're piercing their darkness with your ray of light that is a drug that you cannot live without. So that's me. I'm going to pass this around and let each person uh, talk a little bit about, just a little bit about them. We're going to start right over here with you. Okay, my name's Bondi, and I've been with Bach for a couple of years now. I have got involved just with friends that were in the organization, and we started coming around and just like what they do and what they stand for and wanted to be involved. Hmm. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Shark. Um, about three years ago, I got my first Harley. Um, I was uh, in Baca about 10 years ago, and things happened that we just couldn't, couldn't have it, didn't have the time for it, and I couldn't dedicate what I wanted to dedicate to Baca. Um, so I got my first Harley three years ago and started writing, and our president at the time said, um, you ought to come back and hang out with us. And I knew a few of the people and decided I'd come back and really felt that um, I'm going to get emotional. I really felt that I found something that really fits in my life. And I feel like shots when he said you pierce their darkness. And when they see you roll up, they get excited and they know that you're part of their family. There's, there's no other feeling that can um, that can take that or I mean pass that surpass that um, I love being with my brothers and sisters and the common goal to to empower children that need it in their life mm, thank you thank you hi I'm Sapphire um, I've been in Walker about 10, 10, 11 years, um, we had some friends that we used to ride around in the pocket and we wanted to join. Um, I had a history of being abused, 
good in foster homes. And so this is something that that I really wanted to do because I wish it was there for me when I was younger. So when we went on our first level one and to see what you do for those kids, uh, to help them feel afraid or not feel afraid in which the world they live. It was addicting and that's how and I'm here and I love what I do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lucy. Uh, I'm going on five years now, this year, this fall. Uh, that was like shots. I didn't know much about it when I first joined. I, I rode motorcycles my whole life and uh, met some of the guys and thought we were just going to go ride motorcycles and do wild stuff until I really found out what we did on the backside and what our mission was and what we, what we could do for kids. And it's been hook, line, and sinker ever since then. Mm. Just being able to give back. And it is just something phenomenal to be able to see those kids light up when they hear those bikes coming down the road and they know who, who's coming and, and what's coming for them or, you know, to be with them and support them and be able to make their lives a little better. Yeah. Mm. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Taz, and uh, I've been in 10 years and uh, joined as a result of my childhood. Uh, won't say a whole lot about that, but uh, I joined to make a difference because I didn't have it when I was a kid. So. We heard about it from a buddy that I worked with, knew for about 25 years. And so we joined, and me and my wife. It's it is it's awesome. It really is awesome to see what the kids and uh, see them light up and support them. And, that's about what I. That's about all I got. <laughs> he's looking over. He's looking over at me like, take the camera off of me. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> hey, I'm Scooter. I've been in just a little under a year. I saw these guys at like the local fair. Um, I shot the president an email at the time and was like, "You guys looked awesome. I want to look awesome with you guys." And. <laughs> I <laughs> um, started showing up. I've done a lot of um, nonprofit volunteer work, um, but I kind of combined my passion for motorcycles and helping kids because I love working with kids. And so it's just a win-win situation for me to see the difference that we all together make for these kids is incredible. Amazing. Thank you. Real quick, I'm going to call them out real quick. Will you stand up and turn around? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> So where he doesn't have a back patch, that is something uh, that it takes a lot to get. You have you have to be tried and true, and you go through a full background check before you're able to uh, be introduced to any of the kids that we help. Um, that doesn't mean that he's not there for the kids. That means that he's he's on the process. If you if you show him your cherry. <laughs> that patch right there we call the cherry that means that they've the that they are working towards being a full patch member yeah and just so, like any other club right what's that just like any other club right kind of but we're not a club we're we're a non-profit organization that helps abuse children and not feel afraid anymore uh we do get lumped into uh people think that we are clubs and i and i try and correct them every time i can because that's not what we are our intent is not to be a motorcycle club our intent is to uh, help afraid, abused children to not feel afraid anymore. And we'll do whatever it takes to make that happen. Mm. Amazing. Mm. So um, I would love to hear a little more. When you said there was a book, so somebody came in and printed a book or was it actually for Baca? So it was a book about Baca back in the day and it was... <laughs> Love them to death, but it was a very poorly written book. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we did, we we did print it, but I mean, it was uh, 
it wasn't it wasn't written correctly. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but it got me into the organization, so it did a damn good thing. <laughs> yeah, it did because you've been in it forever. I mean, you've just been. I just remember through all these years, like that. This has been your passion. Yeah, you know? it has. And that's what I love about this organization. Whenever I went and I spoke to you about this, how it literally is this passion. And I can see clearly with each and every person that there is this passion and it's it's so much more than probably the reason why everyone joined, right? Yeah, yeah. I get more out of Baca than I could ever give. I'll, I'll be honest with that. Like it's being able to see these kids' faces and after them not being able to, they're so scared they're not coming out of their house. They're so scared they're not going around in public. They're so scared to, of many different things and being able to see the difference of them the first time that we interact with them, peeking out the door, scared to come out to say hi to us to a couple of visits later where we are having to get our bike off our bikes so fast because we're worried they're going to climb on the hot engine and burn themselves because they're trying to jump up and give us a hug. I mean, it's night and day difference. Mm -hmm. You mind taking a minute and just explaining exactly what it is that you do? Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, the way that it starts is we have to have a parent or, or, or guardian that is uh, willing to, that invites us into the home. We have to have a leg to stand on to go in and to help that abused child. Um, and so at that point, the parent or guardian will call uh, our helpline. Um, our helpline has our child liaison on the other side of it. So this child liaison has been trained how to handle situations to make sure that we weed through You'd be amazed at how many moms try and say that there was abuse uh, just to try and get us to show up to their custody battle case where there really wasn't any actual abuse. And so we actually make sure mm -hmm. that there is, that there unfortunately was abuse. We uh, need to make sure that it has been reported to give the justice system a chance to work. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. We all know how that works, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I, I always say sometimes there's justice and sometimes there's just us. Because a lot of times the justice court system doesn't work. This week we saw it work well, actually. We had a double conviction for, uh, for the case that we sat in for two days this week. And those are wins. Those are wins that, that we do. But so anyways, from there, when, we get the, when the child liaison gets the phone call, like I say, runs through, make sure that it is... Uh, uh, an actual abuse case that it's been reported. We, we get the, the case number. Then at that point, they take the information to, the, to uh, our chapter executive board. Um, they, at that point, determine if this is it within our mission, within our scope of what we do. We have a clear mission statement. It is very precise of what we do. And that is all we do. We, we don't do other we're not here. There's many great organizations that do many things. And we have a clear purpose that we're here to empower abused children. And that's it. That, that is what we do. And we have a good way of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so can I stop you just for a second? Yeah. So that mission statement is actually going to be in the description below. So if anybody wants to see that mission statement, just go and check out the description. Beautiful this video. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So then from there, um, once the board determines this is within our scope, this within our mission, with, within our purpose, we then uh, arrange for what we call a level one of intervention. A level one is when we bring everyone that is available, everyone that can show up, and we show up pipes blaring, we show up uh, to the family's house, we set up an, a, a visit, and then we, we show up to, to the family's house or a safe place if the house is not a safe place um, for us to visit. And we, I'm not even joking, we, we, go, we go in and we make a statement. We, we're blaring our pipes, we come in loud, we come in proud, we make sure that everyone knows that this kid is a part of us and to not mess with this kid. And, and the thing about it is when we show up after our uh, level one, the kids get it. They've dealt with all these different, I understand like the government agencies, they all have red tape and they all are told what they can and can't do with us. We're there for the kid and nothing else. That is the only reason not one of us is paid from the top down. Every one of us is fully, fully um, nonprofit. I mean, it is, we, none of us are paid. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so then at that level one, um, we actually have named, we've given them a name, a road name, 
as you saw, we all have road names. Um, the reason why we go by our road names, us personally, is because my children, my mother, my sister, none of them signed up for this. If we used our real names, I mean, you think of what we're doing. Our goal is to end child abuse. And the way to end child abuse is to put every perpetrator away, every pedophile in prison or dead. That's that. I mean, we're not killing them. Let me back that up. <laughs> that, that came out way wrong. But, but I mean, we, we want the death of child abuse is what I meant by that. <laughs> but, <laughs> all right. So... <laughs> So that is, that is our purpose and that is our goal. And, and so we have a target on our back. I mean, that's, let's be real, this patch on, that we wear on our back, I, I wear it loud, I wear it proud. I wear it every time I'm on my motorcycle. I wanna make sure that every kid that, I've, that we have helped sees us around so that they know that we're around. I wanna make sure every pedophile that we are against knows that we're around. Hopefully it can deter them from doing it again. Um, so anyways, that's, that's why we go by our road names. Now the kids, we give the kids a road name and we usually let them pick it. Or if we, if we think of something about them or something, we, we can help them pick it, but they usually pick their road name. And then at that point, we will actually bring a vest with their road name, with a back patch, a little Baca uh, kids back patch. We've got a few different ones that they can choose from. Um, and we bring them their own vest so that they know that they're a part of us. And uh, we give them a vest, we give them a teddy bear, we give them a bunch of coloring books and a bunch of cool things. Um, uh, and, and then we let them know that they're a part of us now. And that if they're ever scared, they can call us. They get assigned two primary contacts. The primary contacts are usually the two people that are geographically closest to the family in case we need to respond. And so they, they have both of the, their cell phone numbers as, along with our, um, the child liaison's number. But uh, so we give that to them and let them know that if they're scared, they call us. If they're in danger, they call us. If they're in danger, call the police first. Always call the police first, call us second. We usually have a better response time than the police do though. I'm not even joking. We almost always beat them there. So I believe that. Yeah. Um, so then the level level one of intervention is one of the most more powerful, empowering things. It gets them realizing that they have this big group of ugly bikers that will do anything for to make them make them safe and to try and keep them safe from, from further abuse. So from there, um, we've got, like I said, we got to assign the two primary contacts. Those two primary contacts will set up visits and they'll have anywhere between three and four visits, depending on, on how their improvement goes. Um, they uh, go and play games with them. They, they, they talk, to, they find out, make sure that they're in therapy. Let, let's be real. We're not therapists. We don't try and be therapists. That's We'd screw kids up. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> no, we're not therapists. There is therapists within our organization. Every chapter has a, has a therapist designated to them uh, for us to, A, some of the situations are very hard for us to deal with. And so we can call on them if we, if we are not sure how to handle a situation. Um, and B, that therapist it can help give guidance or refer good therapists in the area um, uh, when our families need it. Uh, we do uh, raise uh, raise money uh, for uh, uh, we do raise money for to help pay for therapy. Uh, and when I say therapy, if the family doesn't have the means for therapy, we we will help pay for that. Um, that can be extracurricular things as well. If, if their therapist and us feel like uh, a bicycle would be therapy, help them through the, the therapy process, we could do that. Karate, um, many different things have we done. If, if us and the ther therapist think it would be beneficial in their therapy path for that, we, we will help provide that if the family doesn't have the means. So um, from there, um, we go to court with them. If they have to testify or if they have to appear in court, 
uh, we will show up and we show up in masses. We, we make sure that we have enough uh, members that, and members and supporters to surround the child, to protect them so that they don't have to get intimidated by the perpetrator or the perpetrator's family. Very, very it, it's huge. It, it is, it is huge. We uh, just this week we're in a, in a case, and the perpetrator's family were trying to stare stare this this child down and trying to intimidate this child not to speak, and we were able to create a barrier, a wall at all times. Whenever court was out of session, we had a whole wall of, of BACA members so that they could not, the perpetrator and everyone on the other side couldn't even see through to this child. Mm -hmm. And then when they have to go out to the restroom or anything, we circle, we put a circle of, of bikers around them and take them. And then they go out into the bathroom and they come back and get in the circle and we walk them past because uh, like I say, we do everything we can to try and empower them. And, you know, there was, there was many, many years ago, there was this little girl that was bouncing around before court and, and one of the Baca members who leans over and says, are you okay? And she's like, I got a pee. <laughs> and he's like, go ahead. We'll, we'll, we'll make sure that they don't start without you. And she's like, stone cold face said, no, he's out there. Oh, and so created a circle around this little girl walked past uh, perpetrator. She went to the bathroom, came back out, got back in the circle. As they were walking past the perpetrator again, she swam out in front of the Baca, uh, the, the Baca members and flipped them off. <laughs> I didn't mean, encourage right? that, but that just showed you the empowerment that Baca gives to these kids in the courtroom. They're not scared anymore. They know that we are more scary than that person that did this to them. And then mm. we got their back. Mm. So court is the best and the worst part of Baca for me. Um, the best because I know that we are empowering these kids to put these people away so no one else has to go through it. The worst is having to hear what these kids go through and having to cope. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've left court and gone home and cried in the shower. Because I just heard what dad, uncle, brother did to this four, five, six, seven year old girl, all the way up to, you know, all ages. I mean, it's, and it's not just girls, it's boys. I mean, as you guys know, it's one in three girls. And, and I believe the last uh, statistic I heard was one in six boys that get abused by the time they're 18. And mm -hmm. so that is our goal is to stop that and break the chains of abuse. A lot of the times these kids will become abusers themselves if they don't work through it because that's what they knew. That's what they were, that's what, what they were taught. And so not knowingly they become abusers themselves when they get older. And so we try to make sure that they're not scared. They go, they go through therapy, they work through it. So they do not become abusers themselves to my knowledge. And we've done re research, but from my understanding, every Baca child that we have ever helped since 1994 has never become an abuser themselves to, mm -hmm. what, to what we know. Wow. So I know what we do works. I know what we do. I mean, seeing these kids light up after a couple of times, hearing moms tell us that, that they, they haven't done this or they haven't done that since the abuse happened. And we get into their life and they're back to being able to do that, the, those things. Um, I'm going to talk about our level two, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about how it was started. Does that sound good? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So our level two of intervention is when there is a direct threat or the child is scared that there might be a threat. So what we do is we have a minimum of two BACA members that post up at their house or at a safe place for 24 hours a day until the, the threat is alleviated, until it's gone. Um, the, what we do is if the perpetrator shows up, we immediately call the police. We make sure we're a barrier so that person cannot get to the family. 
And we try to keep conversations going with them to keep them there because if there's a protective order, the police have to see that that they're that, that perpetrator's there to get a solid be able to, to take him away. If it's my word versus his, sometimes that's hearsay and, and that sometimes. So we try and one guy will will walk off and get on the phone with the police and say, get over here now, while the other one tries to have conversation and make sure that they don't that you know can't get to the, to the family, but tries to keep them there so that they can get caught violating their, their protective order. Um, Do you, a quick, is that uh, only in the state of Utah that, or is that something? That's that, Bacawai. Well, that um, the, cause you and I were talking about that, how there has to be a witness or something. What was, oh, I don't know on outside of Utah, but in Utah, um, if the police doesn't see it, this yeah. is from the way that I was told. If the police officer doesn't actually see that person on their property, they most likely will not do anything about it. And so that's why we try and I know it, it ticks me off. But even if y'all are there. What's that? Even if y'all are has to see it. Yep, the officer has to see it. So that's insane. That's what I've been told. I haven't like looked that up myself. And so I've just gone off of what I've, what I've been told. And that's, so that's what we do. We just make sure we, we entertain them until, until law enforcement shows up. We, we don't let them know the law enforcement's on the way because we want them to get caught there. I like how you say entertain them. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, with the level twos, uh, in Washington County, the one for, so we're in the St. George, Utah chapter. Um, we cover Washington County area of Utah and the longest level two that I believe we've done, oh, I know that we've done, uh, is 14 days straight where we've had a minimum of two, two patch members there for 24 seven for 14 days. The perpetrator told that little girl that if she spoke in court, that he would kill her mom and her dog. And so we stayed out there and I don't believe I've never seen any of them show up down in St. George. Um, if they have, they've seen us and they kept driving. But in the St. George area, we've, we actually, all of our level twos have been very successful where, where the kids were, were not, not seen by, by the, the perpetrator. Well, you know, I feel like that's kind of what happens, right? Because a lot of times they're cowards anyway. Mm -hmm. And so if there's other people involved, then the threat seems to dissipate. Yep. I mean, because they Very will true. see you and keep going, right? I'm not going to say they aren't coming. What I'm saying is that that tends to be almost textbook with all of this. So that's amazing that you're yeah. able to do that. Yep, it is. It is a very crucial part of what we do. Sometimes it's boring as hell, but, but we're there for a purpose. You know, we're just sitting out there and twiddling our thumbs for, for, for hours on end. But uh, we know that we're making sure that this child or the family is safe from, from further abuse. Mm -hmm. mm, that's good. Can we jump into how Baca was started? Um, was there a level three? I can't remember if you and I were talking about that. There's not. No. Okay. I would love to hear how Baca was started. I'd love to hear the symbolism of a patch. Okay. And then um, we'll take a look at time because I have one more question for you too. And I don't even know if Sarah has questions. <laughs> I would definitely, okay, yeah, just go ahead. And I do have one question I'd like to ask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to know where else in the U.S. you have chapters. Do you have a chapter in Kentucky where I am located? Because I would love to um, find a connection if there is a chapter or maybe there's a way to get one started. <laughs> yes, there is. There is okay. chapter, uh, I, there, I believe there's multiple chapters. I'd have to jump on the website and see. Uh, we are in 48 states in the U.S. Uh, and we are in uh, 18 countries and we currently have eight chapters within Utah. Mm. Maybe. But if you go on to bacaworld.org, you mm -hmm. can jump into, you go into the USA and then you go into um chapters and then you'll be able to to find the chapters that's closest geographically closest to your area or which ones cover your area um the thing i love about baca is we like riding our motorcycles so even if the kids far far away we'll ride and we'll we'll, we'll, we'll show up that's one thing that our organization does do is we show up 
So mm-hmm. whenever there's an abused child that needs us, we show up. And if, and if for some reason I can't show up, I get someone else to show up. I've got so many, I got thousands of brothers and sisters across the world that if I call for help, if I need power, if I need uh, members there, they show up. I know that there was uh, one time there was a, a court case that uh, was pretty, there was a lot, lot to do with. Uh, and they, we, they had members all the way from Florida come down for this court case, all many chapters in to, to call, uh, uh, Arizona. So it was a, but like I say, like if we, if, if we need more, we, we put out the SOS and people jump on their bike within minutes and they're on their way here. Amazing. That is amazing. Cause I feel like with the child, that's where, you know, so much trust is lost, right? Because yep. people have just let them down. hundred mm-hmm. percent. Okay. So Baca was started um, actually in Utah. It was started in Utah County. There was a child play therapist at BYU that had a private practice as well. He would go through leaps and bounds, do so well while they were in the, in therapy, the ch- child would go home and everything would unravel every time they, every time he'd go home, I'd try in different angles, different, di- different ways of trying to break through this child of being scared. Cause I mean, you talk to pretty much any therapist and their number one, if it's an abuse case, their number one thing to start the therapy process is taking away the fear so that they can actually open up and break through. And so he's like, I wonder if I bring a bunch of my biker friends over to his house, if that could do something. And so he grabbed a bunch of his biker friends, went over, went over, rode their bikes over. The kid actually came outside. They played on the, uh, on the lawn for a little, for a little bit. And then they rode home, got a call from the mom of the kid that night. And she said, I don't know how you did it. And he's like, what did I do? And she said, I, He's out riding his bike. He hadn't left his house in months since the abuse had happened. The kid hadn't. And this kid, they couldn't get to come home when it got dark because he was still out riding his bike after, after, the, after the, the bikers left. Just, he's like, dude, we've got something here. There's something that we did that no one else can do. And so that's how Baco started was that one, that one little child and, and uh, a thought of try, thinking out outside of the box and how to break through making it so this kid's not scared. And so they, then from there, it, Baco was, was named, they, they wrote the mission statement, the mission statement, not a word in it um, has ever changed. The only thing it, that's ever been added to it is where it says incorporated, where it says ink. So that's the only, the only wow. letters that have ever changed since day one is when we got incorporated that those got put into the mission statement. Hmm. Um, and, and then that's been how many years? That was 94. That's crazy. Wow. 1994. And, and I live by that mission statement. It's one of those things that's, you know, in every organization, people start questioning things or, Hey, we should, we should go and do this or, Hey, you know, these people want us to do this for them. Read the mission statement. Is that, is that what our, is that what our mission is? If it, cause all your answers are in that mission statement and, and it's true. So many times, even I have thought, Oh, it'd be so cool for us to go do this. I look at the mission statement. This, this has nothing to do with what our mission is. And so we, we stick true to that mission statement that is very clear of who we are, what we do, and it leaves out everything we don't. So then from there, it grew. It grew fast. Uh, a lot of people, I mean, it started in Utah, jumped over to Texas, and then other states started jumping in. Um, people hearing about it, friends telling friends, and then it got big. It got really big. It got so big that we actually started having, I mean, we've learned so much over the years, you know, started not knowing how, how to do what we're doing. And of course we're evolving. And now we have so much training and continuous training. Uh, we're all going through a bunch of, a uh, bunch of training right now. And it's because when we find out there's a bet, uh, something a little bit better, just a little tweak, something that, that, that can expedite the kids, uh, getting, you know, not afraid faster. We make that tweak you, worldwide. It is one Baca. We've got one Baca. That's the one thing I love about this organization is if I were to move, move to 
uh, Australia, if I were to move to Florida, if I were to move to Texas, I would walk in and do exactly the same thing, the same way, the same policy and procedures. We have it down to a science on how to help these kids, what to do, what not to do, the training of triggers and different things. You know, we, we all go through these trainings to make sure we are doing what's best and we don't ever hinder, bring down the kid. We're always bringing the kid up. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. I love that. I'm just, I'm just always blown away because it, whenever I was talking to you about this, that's what you were saying. Like, it's so streamlined and it's just so honed in and you really are breaking this pattern of abuse, which is what we're all about too. With Red Lotus Life is breaking that pattern ancestrally mm -hmm. and generationally. And so I just, yeah, I'm going to dive deep into your website Do it. <laughs> probably after that. So for everybody who's for watching, sure. the website will be in the, in the description box below. So you'll be able to see that too, to see if there's a chapter there for you. Um, Absolutely. And another thing that's on that website that you'll find is uh, we actually did a third party study because we know that this works. We know for a fact, but we wanted a third party to do an actual study of our, of our cases. And the, the study is actually on the website where it shows beyond a reasonable doubt that with Baca in an abused child life, they are better off with us in, in, in their life than they could have been without. How long are you in the child's life? So we, we always say once a Baca child, always, always a Baca child. But our goal, we're not big brothers, big sisters. We're not there to check on them every week and every day and everything. Our goal is to go in, empower the child to not feel afraid anymore, and then step away and let them flourish. We go in and uh, we do the level, the in initial contact, the level one. And then uh, if we need to do a court case, we, wherever that court case is, we'll always show up with court. Then we have the three or four follow-up visits with the primary contacts. If, we did, if they feel that we need to have another group visit at some point, we can do that. We can deploy another level one uh, where the whole group goes. But we're in and out within a couple months. And wow. and it unless they need us. But then we always tell them, if you're ever scared, call me. We'll be there. We'll show up. We always give them a teddy bear. And in our level one, every, every um, member hugs the teddy bear. And so we say, whenever you need a, to, uh, whenever you need to hug us, you hug this teddy bear and you are hugging every single one of us. Mm. And, you know, it is, it's amazing how these kids get it. I mean, they, they know we're here for them. They know that we showed up just for them and they get it. Mm. I, love it. I think, well, let me ask you this. Do you think because you guys are in and out that instead of being more of like an enabling or a codependency, do you think that's why there's been so much success? Yes. We actually, at one point, um, uh, years ago, we actually did, we would go and follow up with them. And I mean, quite honestly, I think we were doing it more for us than we were doing it for them. And it ended up being enabling because we're turning into a crutch and not a stepping stone to mm -hmm. a bright, pure future. I mean, we want them to get their innocence back. We want them to feel like they can be a kid again. And then we want to step away so that they can be that kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's powerful. It is powerful. Would you mind me asking one more question? Yeah. Um, on average, just so the audience can know statistically about how many children, like every few weeks or every month, are you having to protect? It's unfortunate, but the way I, I like to answer that is we show up whenever we're needed. I know that there is many cases, many kids that need us. Unfortunately, there's a lot of parents that brush it under the rug and they don't realize how much damage they're actually doing to their child. A mm -hmm. lot of times the parent will think, you know, how, and they will be embarrassed. How did I let this happen to my child? And so they don't want to it to get out. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they just, they just feel like that it doesn't, um, 
it doesn't need to be dwelled on that if they just kind of move on, then it'll be better, but they don't realize that that kid uh, most likely, if it, especially if it's sexual abuse, will be, will be dealing with um, boyfriend, girlfriend problems, marital problems, um, the way that they treat, the way that the, the way that they set boundaries with their significant other, all of that is out the door. They, because they've been broken so hard and they didn't work through it. Mm-hmm they're going to be dealing with it the rest of their life until they actually do. And, you know, you, you hear stories of these people in their forties and fifties that start a therapy process from something that happened when they were 10 that's and they the didn't realize do. what's that. I said, that's the work that we do. Actually. Yeah. 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 And, the, and, and they don't realize that it could have been fixed, not fixed. You can't fix some, someone that's been abused. You can't fix that. You can't take that away, but you can do, do what's best for them. And that is to let those kids work through it so that they can process it, move forward, realize it, that they're not the ones that are at fault because most of the kids think that they did something wrong mm-hmm. um, and they can move on. And then at that point, once they work through it, they can start being kids again. They can start be, playing. And if they work through it with a good therapist, it's not going to, there's a less chance of them actually dealing with it in relationships down the road. I mean, it's, it's huge to once it's found out to get in, take away the fear, get them to work through it with therapy so that they can live a good, healthy life. So let me ask you this question (laughs) and then we probably could go into the symbolism, but I, so I was one of those moms. I mean, I was, I'm I'm not going to say I was one of those moms. I didn't know Baca exist. Like that's actually when I was single afterwards. Right. And I was going through my own healing and everything is whenever I discovered Coney points for kids. And that was actually extremely healing for myself and my family, my children. And that's where I saw Baca. I didn't quite realize everything that happened and what it was, but you were saying that you have to have a child abuse case first to even get involved. And so for someone like me, I'll share my experience. So I was one of those people that never, I was in an extreme, extreme relationship that was domestic violence. Not once did I call the police. I was, um, when my, well, I guess I don't want to share too much because this is their story too, but when it was reported, we didn't get that case. We re- we really didn't, even though there was recordings and there was, you know, so much documentation, we didn't get the case. So what do you, I guess the, there's two questions here. What do you say to the people out there? Because I didn't even realize I was in an extremely abusive case, like relationship, zero clue, zero clue that I was in this, even an abusive relationship, let alone a violent one and an extreme one because of the conditioning and everything that was happening. Right. And what do you say to the people out there? Because these, these are the types of people that are actually watching this. This is our audience. Our audience are the people that are like, I don't look like the person on the billboard. So how can I possibly even start to begin this process? I guess, what would you say to somebody like that? So I totally agree with you because I believe you're a product of your environment. And if that's the environment you've, you've been in for so many years, you're going to think that that's normal. And usually the, the abuser will try and make it feel normal and, and tell you that it is normal, that you have to take this and the kid, ha- you know, the kid's going to get beat up if, uh, uh, when, I, when I say he's going to get beat up or, uh, or, you know, the sick pieces of crap that, that think that they have to sleep with their daughters and, and all that. And the wives think that that's normal. It, your product of your environment. And so you need to really figure out, really figure out what is normal and not what you're not with your blinders on, because it is not normal to be abused. It is not normal to allow your kids to be abused. If your kids are being abused right now, and if they are scared, get away from that person that is abusing them and call us and we will help that child report the report. It. Like I say, it justice system doesn't always work, but when it does work, it puts them away. 
we, mm. we, this case, uh, it's on my mind because I spent two days in, in court, but this case got two convictions of, of rape uh, to a child. He's going to get 25 years to life mm. because of this brave, brave person, this brave, brave kid that got up, had to deal with family disowning this child. Mm-hmm. Everything she did could prevent, even if it's just one child from having to do it. But usually, as most of us know, pedophiles are multiple offenders. They usually have 10, 10 plus kids under their belt before they ever get caught. And so it's these kids speaking out so that no other child has to live through it. They're my heroes. Absolutely. Hands down, they're my heroes. Mm. So can people call, I mean, I know, so, okay, here's the deal, right? People don't want to call the police because a lot of times there's retaliation, right? It's just, that's kind of how it is. At least that's how it was with me. And also kind of like, this is a family affair, that type of thing. So if somebody is watching this and they don't want to call the police, they don't want to get the authorities involved, can they call someone in Baca to, I guess, get advice on what they can do. I know that you can't get involved until there is a case, but can you, can they reach out to you to say, this is what you can do here in your local area? So they can call our hotline. We will encourage them to report it so that we can help them. Um, We do uh, tell every family that they need to report it, that that is the first step of them actually helping their kids out. If you're not willing to report it and you stay in that house, you are actually enabling that 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 behavior. You are actually being a part of the abuse. I mean, I'm, I'm just going to call it what it is. You're not if you're not going to pull them out of out of an abusive situation, then you're enabling the abuse. And every person that every person, if their spouse or significant other is abusing their child, they need to take a stand. They need to step up for themselves. They need to step up for those innocent kids that, that do not deserve what they're getting. They need to make a stance and get away, find an exit, get out of there, do whatever it takes to get out of there, report it, call us, and we will do whatever we can to protect, uh, protect the child from any further abuse. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think on that note, do you mind showing the the symbolism of the patch and everything? Because that was Let's powerful do it. too. Scoot. Yeah. You want to do it? <laughs> yeah. We're we're putting we're putting our newest guy on the on the spot right now to see how well he knows it because he yeah. should know the colors of these patch. <laughs> okay. okay. So you notice our colors are white, red, and black. So the black is going to symbolize just the dark times that the child is going through. Um, The white is going to be the innocence and pureness of the child. And unfortunately, the red will be the bloodshed that comes from child abuse. Mm -hmm. Um, So you'll see a big old fist with Baca on the patch. The fist is our fight against child abuse. Um, with the skull meaning death to child abuse, so we don't have to help out. Not us killing them. Not, <laughs> not, not us killing them. I <laughs> um, And so these, there's also chains on here. I don't know if you can see those very well. There's right here on the side. We like to signify those as like the unification of Baca. Like we are one Baca. It can also be symbolized as um, our connection with the kids as like chains are really tough. They do not break. We are there for the kid no matter what. Mm. One other, one other, uh, um, another thought to the chains. I've heard it both ways. The chains are for us breaking the chains of abuse. Yes. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you. At a kid. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm doing it. <laughs> Way to put the newbie on the spot, right? <laughs> yeah, he did a great job, though. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. <laughs> okay, well, I only have one more question, but Sarah, do you have any? Before no, we the, wrap up? the only thing that I was really curious about is, have you yet had any of the children come back and join the organization? Yes, we have. 
Yes, yeah. we have. We've actually had quite a few over uh, throughout the country that once they became 18 years old, they ended up getting a motorcycle and now are uh, full patch Baca members that are helping abuse children to not feel afraid. Mm, I love it. Beautiful. Yeah. Giving back. Mm-hmm. Okay. So to wrap it up, I would just like to ask what has been your most impactful experience? Cause I know you've been in it for a long time. Huh. There's so many. There's so many, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's so many stories, so many court cases, so many level ones. It's sad that there's so many, but it also feels it good that they're so impactful. You know, there was one and it was these three boys and this girl. This one boy stayed away from us. He like we'd show up for the, we showed up for the level one. He kept his distance. And one thing that we do, just so you know, is we give, make, we give the kids their choice back when they were abused, all of their choices was taken away from them. Mm-hmm. And so we give, we give them the opportunity in Utah, not in all States, but in Utah, we give them the opportunity on a level one to, to go on a ride. Um, and so we'll actually have a ride team where we have bikes that surround the whole, the one, the one bike that has the kid on it and, and we take them on a motorcycle ride. And that's usually a very impactful part of the level one. And it, and it works really well in Utah. Anyways, he didn't want to go off for a ride. We, we said, that's great. You know, of course it's, everything is their choice. And, and so then, uh, through the follow-up visits, he kept his distance, didn't say much. The other kids actually interacted with us pretty well, but, but this one boy didn't. And then we go to court, we're in court and we do what we do. We show up, we're there. Uh, We surround the kid, the family when going past the perpetrator and he goes up and he actually, he does an impact statement. It was during sentencing. He did an impact statement and then we walk out of the courtroom. He's still distance. He comes running up and he puts his arms around me and he said, I couldn't have done it without you there. What I did. And I, excuse me, I don't know how, I didn't think we did one thing for that kid. The other, the other ones, I felt like we did, but he told me that if I wasn't in the courtroom that day, that he wouldn't have been able to get up there and speak. Mm. And so we don't ever know how big or how little little we are helping these kids out we show up no matter what because sometimes we have no clue that was but that's probably why that was the biggest takeaway for me is i didn't think i was doing one thing for that kid Mm. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) she She said thanks a lot you got me crying I, I cry every time I even see you guys out and about. I mean, you were just at the car show and I, I was going, in fact, Derek was saying, we should go by and say hi, but we didn't have time. And I'm like, I can't, we got to just keep going <laughs> <laughs> because I know the work that you do is so powerful, just even your presence. So just exactly what you just said, even you never know the people that don't, that are walking by even your booths or wherever you are you're impacting them, even if they're not coming to say, you know, to find out anything, they know who you are. So I just want to say, thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to share an experience or um, would like to answer any of the questions that we may have been asking or wants to share (laughs) anything? (laughs) I don't have any story. Something impactful. What? (laughs) 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 That fell out of my chair. (laughs) Anyone got anything they want? Sure. You just want to pray. Yeah, there was this one uh, girl. we didn't think that, we, that we're making the first in her life and we keep on going and she'd keep on cutting and cutting and cutting and she would cut so deep where she would have to go to the emergency room and have staples uh, put them in um, but 
trying to think of other things won't cry. Anyway, when we went to court with her and um, and uh, she testified and yeah, um, and when she watched the guy walk out and he was in handcuffs and then we go to visit her the next day. She says, thank you. You know, I couldn't have done it without you. And um, she says that she never needs to cut again. Oh. His pain's gone. Mm. And that was really impactful for me because we didn't think we were made, making a difference in her life, but we actually did. So. Mm. There's many cases that we know hands down that we made a case, that, that, that we made a difference. Like we see, we see them flourish, but then there's these few like ones that we're talking about. And that's why those are the, probably the most impactful for us because we can see all the other ones. Like almost every, almost every case, if the child's scared, we're in their life and we see the difference. We see them blossom. We see that we actually did pierce their darkness with our light. And, and, but it's the, these couple stories that we just told are the ones that stick out the most because it was like, holy crap, we, we thought we were doing nothing. We thought we were flies on the wall here right now, you know? And yeah, it was, so those are, those are the ones that I think that's why those two probably peek out to us the most because the other ones are normal as, as much as I hate to say that word of talking about anything to do with abuse, but within our organization, that's, that's the outcome that these kids get is they get empowered and they open up and then they can move on to, to live a healthy life. That is huge. Mm -hmm. So how can we help support you? Get the word out that it, there is so many kids, so many kids that need us. They are scared right this moment of the abuse that they've gone through or, or are going through. I am amazed at how much in the 17 years that I've been in Baca and how many PR events, how many booths I've sat at, how many public events, uh, PR events. I mean, we try and get everywhere in the public so everyone knows who we are and that we're free. We're a nonprofit. No one here is paid. We show up for the kid when we say we're going to show up, if that child's abused and, and they need us, we show up. And there's so many people that don't know it. And there's so many people that need us. And we're re we are all ready to go to work because that's what we show up to do. Amazing. Well, I think this organization is incredible in every way. I think mm -hmm. all of you are incredible. Thank you for sharing your time with us and your hearts and this passion for what you do because unfortunately you are needed and I just think this is um I can't believe that I didn't realize the the total impact after knowing you all these years right. I, I didn't realize how far and wide this ripple went so I just want to say thank you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for joining us. Every single one of you that's there. Yes. And um, if anybody would like more information about BACA, yeah, thank you so much, ladies. <laughs> if anyone else would like more information about BACA, you can see all the description below. There's a link below. Um, the website is amazing. There's this really amazing video on there as well that get you teared up <laughs> and so one thing the one thing that i do encourage every one of your listeners every person that listens to this jump on bacaworld.org watch that video on the home page it's about 15 minutes long it talks in depth it actually has a child that we've helped out uh, her tell her story of baca and I feel everyone needs to see that so that they know because at some point in your life you're going to find someone that you need to refer us to I want you to understand exactly what we do so you can refer them with, with uh, knowing that, what's that? With conviction. With conviction, yep. Yeah. And, you know, those statistics blew me away too. Even though I hear the statistics all the time just because of the work that Sarah and I do, but that one in three girls and one in six boys. I think the statistic with the boys has actually um, gone up. I think it's one in three. I think it's the same anymore. So, okay. and it's just, thank you so, so much. Um, so much gratitude for in our hearts. Um, 
Is there anything else that you wanted to add before we say goodbye? I would like to share something. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, Lori, for introducing me to you and to each of you to this organization. I can feel the power and the passion and the empowerment and the chains that are being broken. And if you don't ever believe that you've not made an impact, um, I just want to say that even me sitting here witnessing and hearing your story and the work that each of you do has been incredibly healing to me. So uh, yeah, just continue to create that ripple because it's really, really powerful and really beautiful. And I really, really feel your light. So much gratitude. Mm -hmm. We will continue. I promise you that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for having us on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.